I, I usually end up um, talking to, uh, to groups of, um, of, of scientists and, and they all think in terms of numbers and images and you have to have PowerPoints. And as a lawyer, I think in terms of words and I never use them, which uh, uh, ends up causing some people to say, that was brilliant because people actually paid attention to you. They didn't fall asleep. And, and the truth is I've just never got around to learning how to do PowerPoint. But anyway, as, uh, as most of you are lawyers, I'm going to count on you uh, thinking in terms of words. So, so I'm a lawyer. I've uh, spent over 30 years doing um, almost exclusively uh, public health work, and the last few years all of it uh, pro bono, uh, all on, on the idea that figuring out why people are getting sick is, is a medical scientific problem. Dealing with it is social, legal, political issue. And so doctors and scientists can tell us that there's a problem, but it's up to groups like lawyers and politicians, uh, policy people, to figure out what the heck are we going to do about it. And it, it's, it's been that way from the beginning, if you look at the whole history of public health. It's certainly been that way uh, for me and the, the work I've done to try to reduce smoking. And when I got involved, Canada had the highest rate of uh, per capita cigarette consumption of any country outside the Eastern Bloc. Um, we had 42% of 15 to 19 year olds who were smoking every day. We had more of them who were occasional smokers. Uh, I mean, it was an absolutely horrendous situation, and, and we weren't doing effective policy to try to do anything about that. And I thought, well, as a lawyer, I, I could get involved, and, and, and we, could, we could really make a difference. And the, the good news story is that, well, yeah, I, we really did make a difference. So uh, things like playing with, uh, with tax policy, advertising restrictions, health warnings, uh, 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 smoke-free spaces, smoke-free airplanes, all that sort of stuff, we managed within... 10 years, starting from the early uh, 80s, to knock teen consumption from 42 percent uh, who were daily smokers to 16 percent. Uh, and it was simply doing stuff that we knew from the literature would work. Uh, we reduced per capita consumption by 40 percent, teen consumption by about 60 percent. Uh, and it continued to fall, but it wasn't falling nearly as rapidly as you, you would like to have happen. So we went from smoking being seen as our leading cause of preventable death to smoking being our leading cause of preventable death. I mean, it was, it was still a huge problem, and there were a lot of groups we simply weren't reaching. And it was you know, fairly obvious that you know, the, the, the theory in, in public health is you're trying to do things to, uh, uh, to prevent disease, promote uh, uh, healthy lives, and, and then you get to the practice to say, well, what sort of stuff can you do? And it was fairly easy in, in looking at this like anything else that causes um, uh, death, injury, or, 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 um, or, or disease, you know, what are the interventions you have? And whether you're talking about, you know, uh, uh, somebody who wants to play goal in house league hockey, uh, somebody who's using IV drugs, somebody who likes having sex with strangers, somebody who's smoking cigarettes, it doesn't matter what the activity is. If you've got something that's at risk of causing death, injury, or disease, there's four main areas of intervention. You can do things to try to prevent somebody from ever engaging the dangerous activity. So if you say you're, you're thinking of taking up paragliding, you know, maybe I can talk you out of it. You do things to try to get people who are engaging in dangerous activity to stop doing it. Like saying, so you're having unprotected sex with strangers, let, let me tell you why you, you shouldn't do that anymore. You do things to protect third parties. You know, I, I see you really like throwing a javelin, how about you don't do it in a crowded park on Sunday afternoon. Uh, and you do things to reduce the risk for people who are going to engage in the activity. So if you're going to have sex with strangers, use condoms. If you're going to be playing house league hockey and you're going to play goal, get good equipment. You know, we, we do things in, in those four broad areas. And it was pretty obvious to me that by you know, the, the late 1980s, we needed to focus more on reducing risk for people who are still going to be using nicotine. Uh, and in fact, with the Tobacco Products Control Act that we got passed in... 1988, there was a section 17 sub 1 that I helped draft that said the restrictions on advertising, free samples, etc., you could get an exemption from those if you could show that you've got a product that's less hazardous than an existing tobacco product and would be used in place of an existing tobacco product, which wasn't actually that tough an onus and, and it could be done through regulation. Nobody tried using it. The cigarette companies took the legislation to court. Um, they got it thrown out in the uh, Supreme Court. And, and of course, suing the government is like playing Calvin ball against Calvin. I mean, you, you ultimately lose because governments make up the rules. The government came back with new legislation. It was even more draconian. No longer had that harm reduction component to it. And harm reduction went from being something that was just seen as what you do in public health, and tobacco control was part of public health, to an area that you just don't do it. 
I mean, we, what, what we need is abstinence. So, so what I want to do is, is give a bit of background as to what I see as the fact situation, the problem that, that, that we face in dealing with, with smoking, with nicotine policy, with vaping, and then talk about what I, I think we might be able to do about it and why that's relevant to, uh, to this group and, um, and the sorts of things that we could do. So to, to begin with, I mean, smoking still, by Health Canada's estimate, killing about 37,000 Canadians a year. Uh, and the World Health Organization estimates that a billion people worldwide are going to die this century from cigarette smoking, assuming we continue to do exactly the sort of things that we're doing now. So that's the status quo. I mean, you know, continue our interventions, uh, but that's what's going to happen, just given how many people are smoking and what we can project is going to happen as incomes increase in uh, lower income countries, et cetera. So 17% of all deaths in Canada this year, they'll attribute to um, d a direct result of cigarette smoking. And, and yet, as much as we demonize nicotine, nicotine isn't the reason they're dying. They're dying because they're sucking smoke into their lungs. So anything that we ingest by sucking smoke into our lungs will cause the diseases smoking causes. You, know, you will get lung cancer, you will get heart disease, you, you, you will get various other forms of cancer, you'll get emphysema, there are very elevated risk of these things. And that's why you go into the homes in the, in the Himalayas where people heat their home and do their cooking with an open fire without a chimney and you see all the, the diseases that are caused by smoking being caused by just breathing in smoke. Uh, if we got our caffeine by, uh, by smoking tea leaves instead of brewing them, we'd be having the same sort of problem. Uh, so uh, essentially, policy should come down to four simple words. It's the smoke stupid. Uh, and this has been reiterated by you know, very reputable groups like the Royal College of Physicians in the UK that has been very good on the issue of nicotine harm reduction. We've known about it. Uh, at least through, since the 1970s with the work Mike Russell was doing on, um, on nicotine in the, uh, in the UK. There was work that preceded that by decades. We have the example of snus in Sweden, which is an oral form of tobacco that somebody just sticks between their, their lip and their gum. Uh, it's done a terrific job of reducing smoking, at least among males in Sweden, to the lowest rate you find anywhere in the OECD, and their disease rates are what lower than you find in any other country, it's very hard to find any harm that's caused by people who are using snus. They're getting their nicotine, they're getting it without smoke. And, and we've known that if, if we look at innovative technology, uh, there, there's actually a, a really interesting history here because it isn't just a matter of what might we do now to replace cigarettes. It's where did cigarettes come from? Because people used nicotine for a long time before we had cigarettes. Cigarettes are relatively recent, you know, starting beginning of the last century, and that was because of technology, of developing a cigarette manufacturing machine, the Bonzac machine, that allowed the manufacture of these little effeminate cigarettes to replace things like cigars and chewing tobacco and various other things that people you know, weren't inhaling smoke into their lungs. So if you go back 100 years, lung cancer was a quite rare form of cancer. You know, early in my career when I would talk to, uh, to doctors, researchers who were training back in the, uh, in the 20s, they talk about being called in to examine somebody or to see somebody who had lung cancer, being told, this is such a rare condition, you may never see it again in your career. And little did they know. Now, back then, the big problem, the biggest cause of cancer deaths by far was stomach cancer. It wasn't lung cancer. Lung cancer was rare. Stomach cancer was, was, was huge. And innovative technology hit in that area as well. So while we had cigarettes come along as innovative technology that took nicotine delivery to something where you suck smoke into your lungs and caused lung cancer rates to skyrocket, and by the time of the Second World War, they were now the leading cause of cancer death in North America, stomach cancer plummeted. So in a 30-year period, stomach cancer went from being the most common cancer, uh, uh, cause of cancer deaths in North America to falling by half. In the next 30 years, it fell by half again. And it continued to go down to the point that it's relatively rare. So in the mid-1940s in Canada, stomach cancer was still the leading cause of cancer deaths. It was killing more people than lung cancer, but it was on the way down, and it kept plummeting. And what happened? You know, what sort of expensive, government-run campaign? Well, none of that. It was innovative technologies, refrigerators. 
once we had refrigerators, once the private sector said, yeah, I, th I think we can use the technology to come up with something consumers would like to have, they can afford to have, it will allow them to eat more of what they would like to eat and not have stuff go bad on them and they're not going to have to have as much highly smoked, pickled, salted foods. They can get more fresh fruits and vegetables if they want. We can transport it around now so that you... We got rid of stomach cancer, or, I mean, to the point that it, it became quite rare. Innovative technology. So a really interesting example where the private sector solved the leading cause of cancer death. Well, could we now solve the problem we have with smoking by es essentially innovative technology again, re-engineering nicotine? So in effect, it's a back to the future. Let's figure out, can we give people nicotine without them sucking smoke into their lungs? They used to do it, seemed to work. Um, can we go back to something like that? Works in other places, works in Sweden. Um, seems to be working with an awful lot of vapors. And so I, th I think what we've got is a classic example of a really simple idea that get your nicotine without the smoke. It's the smoke, stupid. But it's meeting what Saul Bellow talked about in the, the Dean's December is zones of incomprehension. You know, something that is so bloody obvious, we can't even see it. Uh, so that there's all this opposition to something like vaping rather than the idea that, my gosh, this is a solution. And again, that, that's not really unusual when you look at, you know, what was the opposition to vaccinations when they first coming out? And, and that was even stronger because, I mean, you were, among other things, interfering with the will of God by deciding who was going to live rather than let God do it. Uh, but there, there's been opposition to any new interventions on, on public health. It's very rare to have something that, that's accepted. Thomas Kuhn and Structure Scientific Revolutions helps us understand how this sort of thing happens. But in this case, it isn't just a matter of, you know, changing a paradigm uh, in dealing with people whose careers are bent on uh, the status quo of them being the experts telling people what to do. I think what happened, and I think I played a big role in, in causing this problem, and that in battling cigarette companies, the, you know, the thing I would do as a lawyer is I would try to destroy their credibility, which makes it much easier to win debates and get policy. Uh, I mean, that's just what we do as lawyers, right? Um, and they made it very easy because, you know, they really took on the role of dragon. They, you know, they, they were saying, no, we don't believe there's any evidence that smoking's caused any disease. You know, we don't, we don't think smoking's addictive, et cetera, et cetera. So it became very easy to demonize them, which made it much easier to get policies through on dealing with tobacco advertising and health warnings and getting smoking off airplanes and out of workplaces. And, uh, but what happened, I think, is an awful lot of my colleagues internalized that to say this isn't just a tactic but this is real, they are truly evil. And now this isn't a battle for health. It's a fight against sin. It's a fight against the devil. Uh, this is a black and white issue. They're a dragon and we're dragon slayers. And, and it, came, it, it be, went from being merely about public health, I think early in, in what we we're trying to do on, on cigarette smoking and disease, to being a, uh, more of a political ideological campaign against an industry, and then that morphed to being not just against smoking, but against any sort of tobacco product that they would have, including smokeless tobacco products that are massively less hazardous than cigarettes, uh, but also against the smokers, to say, well, you know, if, if they're the devil and they're causing this, these people must be sinners, and therefore, you know, we, we need to, to really whack them. Uh, and. And no alternative was acceptable because I think it fit into that idea of sin. It's, it's like some sort of um, uh, very fire and brimstone religion saying, you're doing something that's a sin, and to deal with this, you have to repent. I mean, you have to feel really awful about what you're doing. You have to do penance. It has to be really difficult for you to overcome this terrible thing you've done. And if you don't, you face perdition. You know, you go to hell or you get lung cancer or whatever. Uh, and that paradigm, really a, a quit or die, you've got to quit. And by quit, we mean not just smoking, but any form of tobacco, any form of nicotine. You have to do it now, and you have to do it forever. And then we, we ended up with this bootleggers and Baptists uh, a problem, where when anybody would come up with ideas to replace cigarettes, they could give alternatives, those things were attacked. Because, of course, that's like saying, how about we just allow a little bit of sin? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's not acceptable. So when we had nicotine uh, therapeutic products come up, the Nicorette-type products, 
really, really heavily regulated. You need to protect people from this. You have to have a government regulator that makes sure that you don't deliver very much nicotine, you don't deliver it for very long, you don't deliver it in a consumer acceptable way because what if? I mean, what if somebody liked this stuff and started using it? And, uh, and when people come up with you know, brilliant ideas, and it happened again and again and again, because people would look at this market and say, my God, you know, people are spending the equivalent of $800 billion a year globally buying cigarettes. Most of them don't want to be smoking cigarettes. I can come up with a product that replaces those cigarettes. I could save millions of lives, and I can make billions of dollars, and I could win a Nobel Prize for doing it. I mean, that's going to look really good on a resume. And, uh, and then what they do is they run into all these regulations that essentially ban them. So advanced therapeutic uh, products in, in Texas came out with a nicotine inhaler, sort of a precursor to what we're looking at with vaping now. This is like 20 or more years ago. Gets banned. Uh, people come out with uh, oral nicotine uh, lozenges, uh, pharmacists developing these to help their, their clients quit smoking. And they get banned. Uh, Star Scientific, a little company that was set up by this very entrepreneurial guy who he was out to change the world, he'd made lots of money, and he thought, we'll get rid of cigarettes. So he hires in the former drug czar for the, from the US, the, the White House advisor, Jerry Jaffe, who's one of the world's leading experts on drug harm reduction, dealing with issues like opiates, totally understood nicotine. He brings in Paul Perito, who had been his uh, deputy dr drug czar in those days. He got this dream team of people saying, we're going to come up with something. He came up with these really low nitrosamines. Nitrosamines are the things in smokeless tobacco you want to avoid. So he basically eliminated nitrosamines in the way to develop these little lozenges that you just put in your mouth, suck on the lozenge the way you would a Tic Tac, and for an awful lot of smokers, got rid of the need to smoke. Dream team. They got savaged. They were attacked by the anti-smoking community. There was all sorts of misinformation about their product. Uh, the, uh, the FDA was petitioned to, uh, to deal with it. They ended up going, going out of that business. Um, Snus in Sweden, as I mentioned, we've got decades of proof that this product is massively less hazardous than smoking, acceptable to a tremendous number of people that otherwise would be smoking. What do we do? The European Union bans it everywhere other than Sweden, and then countries around the world decide they'll do the same. Uh, moist smokeless tobacco, again, a smokeless tobacco product, very, very low risk compared to cigarettes. What do we do? We put higher taxes on that than on cigarettes because we don't want people to switch. We want them to quit. And we give massive misinformation. So if you're trying to get information in the United States where there's millions of people actually use this product, many of them simultaneously with smoking and therefore at still elevated risk because they haven't switched entirely, but they don't know that one is less hazardous than the other. You know, polling that shows it's only about 12% of Americans who believe smokeless tobacco is less hazardous than smoking, let alone massively, massively less hazardous. So they don't have the information necessary to move. And if you say, well, look at the authoritative information, even bodies like the Centers for Disease Control are misleading people rather than informing them because they have this whole tobacco-free agenda. We're just going to get everybody to quit. Uh, so. We've ended up with these products that have come along from time to time, been destroyed uh, by the people who consider themselves to be the enemies of the cigarette companies. And that's allowed the cigarette industry to morph into this oligopoly. They've consolidated. Uh, there's very few large multinational companies selling a product that uh, Warren Buffett described as, you know, tell you what I like about cigarettes. They cost a penny to make. You sell them for a dollar. They're addictive. I mean, you can make so much money selling cigarettes. Uh, as the CEO of one of the companies uh, said to me you know, recently with, you know, talking about the disruptive technology and what it could do to them, he said, you know, this used to be a simple business. You know, basically you put a bunch of tobacco at one end of the assembly line, cigarettes come off the other end of the assembly line, and you remember to raise prices twice a year. That was the business model. Or as another CEO said to me, you know, back in the day, the biggest R&D challenge we had was how do you build a wheelbarrow large enough to take home the money at the end of the day? Uh, and, you know, how did they manage to get such a lucrative business selling such a deadly product? Well, we handed it to them. Uh, you know, we, we set the terms of, of the market in a way that, that allowed that to happen, that then gave them a big incentive to continue doing exactly what they're doing. And I think it's consistent with what uh, we're going to hear about uh, what happened with the taxi industry. We, we've seen it in lots of other areas that it ended up being disrupted. Uh, monopoly telephone companies are another really good example. Uh, and so it turned out that we did one of those Ivan Illich things that, you know, the way institutions often end up doing exactly the opposite of what they were set up to do. 
So you have like lung associations and heart foundations that are, they, they're set up to like try to reduce lung and heart disease and then you come along with something that could reduce lung or heart disease and they attack it. Um, and allowing cigarettes to become in another Ivan Illich idea, a radical monopoly, something that just so dominates our consciousness, we don't even think of alternatives. You know, if you're, you, it's, just, it's just smoking. I mean, you know, it's, it's the, what, what, what do you mean? Um, but the problem is, I mean, you know, abstinence only is generally a pretty dumb idea any, anyway, but if you look at the, the history of it, you know, it doesn't work. Um, and we see this when we look at things like, the, you know, the history of campaigns that deal with venereal disease or unwanted pregnancy. Abstinence only, really bad idea. War on drugs, abstinence only, really bad idea. Prohibition of alcohol, bad idea. You know, we, we've gone through you know, various times of somebody saying, I'll, I'll tell you how we're going to deal with this market, we'll just ban it. Um, and that's not a good idea to deal with, uh, uh, with markets. But there's really good reasons for that. It isn't that people are just being obstinate. Um, well, some of it is people are being obstinate. It's that human nature, people are going to do the things that they decide they want to do. And one of the things that we like to do as a species, which we share with a, a very wide range of species, is that to the extent we have consciousness, we seek to alter it. And whether that's with nicotine or with caffeine or with alcohol or rolling down a hill or taking up jogging or having sex, there's all sorts of things that we do to alter our consciousness. People like doing that. Nicotine has advantages in that you know, it can uh, do things like help you be both alert and relaxed. Well, for a lot of people, that, that's, that's a big advantage. Um, but it, it, it goes beyond that because we know nicotine, particularly as delivered by cigarettes, is, is not only really deadly, but it's particularly addictive. The addictiveness of a drug comes from the way the drug is delivered. And that's why nobody gets addicted to a nicotine patch. People do get addicted to, to cigarettes. You get, and, and the same with you look at IV drugs. IV drugs or smoking a drug, it's much more likely you'll get dependent because you get that rapid spike and then it falls off quickly. So you need another one. And uh, so we could deliver nicotine in a different way, but the people who are getting it now are much more likely to be addicted to it. But beyond that, we have really good research from genetics that tells us there's a lot of people that aren't going to be able to quit with the sorts of measures that people like me have done during our career. So having used things like tax policy, which was by far and away the most powerful tool we ever had, that we now have really good research from people like uh, Jason Fletcher at uh, Yale saying, you look at a group of people and those with certain genetic uh, qualities, you have a big tax increase, it has no impact on their smoking, none. You know, they are going to continue smoking. Well, that ties into to, to issues of addiction, but it, it ties into things we're starting to learn now about how genetics does affect behavior. But there's also the neuroscience on self-medication, or, or why people use drugs. So, you know, there's a reason why some of us, if we were out late last night, are having more coffee this morning. You know, that's self-medication. There's reason why I, as an avid, uh, absurdly avid long-distance bicyclist knows where all the best coffee shops are in Eastern Ontario and West Quebec. Caffeine appreciably increases your ability to do endurance exercise. That's self-dosing. You know, you fly internationally. I arrive at Heathrow, which I do very often. I go to the arrivals lounge, I have a shower, I have two cups of coffee. That's self-dosing. In the evening, I'll make sure I have alcohol with my meal. That's self-dosing. Uh, that, but we get into certain conditions where the self-dosing is really pronounced. So one of the effects of nicotine is a gating effect. It allows you to get rid of additional stimuli, which may not be a problem for many of us, but if you're schizophrenic, that's huge. Because if you're schizophrenic, you wouldn't be able to understand anything I'm saying because of whatever that drum thing is that's going on in the background. Uh, I'm guessing it's a reggae band that needs a lot more practice. And uh, the, uh, the, the noise from the hall, the, uh, the, the heaters, you need to filter that out, including the voices telling you to kill yourself. If you can filter that out, you do better. If you've got attention deficit disorder, nicotine helps a lot. If you've got Tourette's, it can help you keep your job. Uh, there's, there's many conditions where we see benefits from nicotine, and it's a cognitive enhancer. Uh, so one of the really fascinating things to me with all the demonization of nicotine, given that I hang out with many of the world's leading experts, leading researchers on nicotine, and they're all generally, you know, the early part of the baby boom generation. An awful lot of them have now started using nicotine. These are the most knowledgeable people in the world on nicotine. They didn't used to use it. The more they learned about it and the more they thought, well, I'm 70 years old now. Uh, given what I've seen about this stuff in uh, cognitive enhancement, I'm going to start using it. They don't smoke. Uh, they get their nicotine from non-combustion ways. So 
So the neuroscience is telling us, the genetics are telling us, human behavior is telling us abstinence only isn't going to work, it's counterproductive. And what it's meant by following this abstinence only view, it's really limited the effectiveness of many of the other measures we use. So we've done all these things like the big graphic health warnings, you know, designed to scare the crap out of smokers, uh, and the smoke-free areas that we've extended absurdly to, to areas where there's really no risk at all to, uh, to anybody else. Uh, we've, we've done this in order to motivate people to change the behavior. But if you're actually trying to change behavior, you have to combine motivation with facilitation. And we're not, telling, we're not giving them valid options for what they can do. Now, we know from social psychology that if you give people, for instance, scare-based health warnings, they are really effective with one key proviso, provided you give people clear, actionable steps of what they can do to deal with the problem. So if I say, oh my god, the building's on fire, the exit's right there, you can go down the stairs, we better get out or we're going to die, we can do something about it. If I say, you know, everybody alive today is eventually going to die. You could be one of the people who dies terribly, painfully, and totally alone. And we crack up, right? Because it's cognitive dissonance. We can't do a bloody thing about it. So if we're saying to smokers, the sorts of messages we put on packages designed to gross them out, et cetera, what do you expect? Well, social psychologists will tell us they will ignore those. They have to because you're not giving them anything to do with the information. If you combined something like, let me tell you what the smoking is going to do to you with something like, and here's an easy way you get around it, it's much closer to saying the building's on fire, the exit's right over there. People can actually act on it. So our failure to move beyond abstinence only has actually greatly interfered with our ability to effectively use the other tools that we're, we're, we're trying to, uh, uh, to, to do. So we end up with a situation where we survey shows the vast majority of Canadians say, I wish I didn't smoke, I'd like to quit. But you go back to the neuroscience, the human behavior, the addiction, the g g genetics, uh, they're not quitting. Well, what if the thing they needed to quit was the smoke? You know, and that it wasn't a matter of them having to fundamentally change their behavior. It was, it was a matter of just, you know, get what you want in another way. You know, what if I said, oh, the, the coffee on the left back there is highly radioactive. If you use it, you'll probably be dead before 3 o'clock. The stuff on the right is not radioactive at all. It's just regular coffee. It only has 26 carcinogens, none of them at a level that's likely to cause us any harm in our lifetime. You choose. I mean, why can't we do something like that with, um, uh, with smokers? So I think what happened is that we ended up with this phenomenal loss of mission for those who claimed that they were trying to do something about public health. Uh, I think there was this ideological thing about we're fighting evil. There was also this ideological view that all problems have to be solved by, by experts, uh, meaning ourselves, I mean, whoever defines the, uh, the problem gets to be the expert, uh, and by big government. And you know, far better that government dictate what we're going to do about uh, things like tobacco and nicotine than that the market does, which I find a little odd because I think if we look at what's happened with liquor retailing and the role of the government in that, or if we look at what's happened with lotteries and the role of the, the government in that, who are they really exploiting with something like that? Are they really helping people? You know, the tax on the statistically challenged. Uh, if you look at casinos, uh, anybody who, uh, uh, I recommend reading the book Addiction by Design that talks about the, uh, the video lottery ter terminals, the machines that are used in casinos now. What they have done to those machines make the cigarette companies manufacture of cigarettes look amateurish by comparison in terms of addiction. Who's running the casinos? Who's going to the casinos? Can they, uh, how, what percentage of the revenue is actually coming from people who are well-adjusted, are having entertainment, you know, the sort of stuff they say in the ads? And that book says it's around 5%. Uh, and we want our governments to take over something else. Uh, that why would we allow our governments to be putting vaping at a disadvantage, which is you know, what they're trying to do, and banning vaping in areas where there's no logical, scientific, public health reason to do that? Why would they say we have to treat it exactly the same as cigarettes? Because they're not. And if you do that, you're protecting the incumbent player. Uh, so, so we've ended up with this cr crazy situation where those opposed to things like vaping, having this very moralistic sort of... Uh, of approach, of looking at it as sin, feel that if they can come up with any possible argument against vaping, then it's valid. You know, any hypothesis is a fact. So kids will use it. 
Well, it doesn't appear to be a big problem. And the kids who are, va are vaping are using little electronic cigarettes that don't have nicotine based on, on the research. They'll get poisoned. You know, the, there's almost no reports of that. And if you compare it to analgesics, where there's hundreds of thousands of reports per year to the CDC in the United States, I mean, we're not dealing with a big issue. It's, it's going to be really, really hazardous if somebody have to breathe it in. Well, the research shows that it's not. But it doesn't stop the arguments from coming, they're, because they're based on ideology. So I find it's, it's like trying to argue with a creationist. It's, it's like it doesn't matter because they've made up their mind on something. And they are not going to listen to any argument that you have. They, they are only going to look at you know, whatever is acceptable to them. So it's essentially what happened to political discourse with, uh, with the, the rise of culture wars. But something really, really interesting happened here. So into that mess came entrepreneurs, and they happened to arrive at a time of internet and social media. And so a new product came out of nowhere, came out of um, a pharmacist in China, uh, Hon Lik, uh, having, you know, like other people, having watched people die from smoking and say, I'm going to come up with something better. And it's interesting to compare him to a group of doctors here in Toronto, who I met about 20 years ago, who come up with a terrific product to replace cigarettes. And they put their own blood, sweat, and tears and capital into this because they were uh, lung physicians. They spent their career watching people die from smoking who couldn't quit realized it was the nicotine that they needed, the smoke that they had to get rid of, and they came up with a product to deal with it. And they approached me after speaking at a, uh, at a conference about 20 years ago here in Toronto, where I was talking about this stuff, and they clearly looked like the cats who swallowed a canary, that they had this thing, they, they were going to revolutionize the world, they're going to save millions of lives, and you haven't heard about it, of course, because they can't even get it on the market. Uh, they, they, uh, if they've got any chance of putting it anywhere, it's not going to be Canada, they, they've moved their, uh, uh, their ideas offshore. They were prevented. But Han Lick came up with this product that started to spread, and it spread not by going to the government and asking permission, but it just ignored that, the way that much of what happens in innovative technology, as we'll hear with Uber, uh, much of what's happened in, in, the, in the area of, of, of technology, they don't like government. You know, they, they like the idea of just, just selling stuff. So it started getting passed around. And little products came out, and people started importing them, and, and the governments really weren't sure what to do, and when governments tried to shut them down, instead of them saying, yes, I guess we'll, we'll stop if you tell us to, you're the government, as they, they were basically saying, screw you, who are you? I mean, we're not going to pay attention to you. Uh, or they'd take them to court and, and, and be able to continue to sell a product. So it was something unlike regulatory agencies uh, uh, were used to. And it was a classic technology play because, you know, the, the way Google talks about you want to get a product not just better than, than what's out there now, you're looking for something that's like 10 times as fast for one-tenth the price. You know, you want a really big sea change sort of thing to, to get somewhere. Well, here you have a product that can retail for way less money than cigarettes and it doesn't make you stink and it doesn't kill you. I mean, th there's, there's a huge advantage to something like that and it started spreading. Uh, and I was mentioning to others uh, here the book called Big Bang Disruption by Downs and Noons. It talks about how innovative technology now has a huge advantage because of the, the role of the internet for getting information. So I can pretend I'm an expert and tell you my view on something, and you can pull out your phones and check Google and find out if I'm full of crap. Uh, and we didn't used to be able to do that as easily. And if you find out I'm full of crap, you're probably on Twitter or you have a blog or so, uh, you're on Facebook, and you tell the whole world that I'm full of crap. Uh, that information gets passed around. And if you find this product works for you and it's got you to quit smoking, you pass that around. Uh, other people start picking it up. So in, before governments could react, we had a tremendous number of users. So when we still have Health Canada saying, these devices are illegal in Canada if they have nicotine in them. Well, they're illegal the way marijuana is illegal in Vancouver. I mean, just it's, it's everywhere. Uh, and, and they can't do anything about it now. So it's like going back to civil rights to say, if your jail only holds 20 people and 400 people have just violated the law in an act of civil disobedience, now what are you going to do? So if you want to close down an uh, uh, innovative uh, industry and it's got 12 employees and 37 customers, you can do that. Uh, you know, I've discussed this with... Um, uh, colleagues globally for many years before these products came out saying, how many users would you have to have before it would be possible to just close something down? You know, if you got a thousand users in the United States and Canada, yeah, 10,000, probably, 100,000, that gets tough. A million, forget it. 
And so what happened is this innovative stuff, just as I think while we're here with Uber, got so popular so fast that governments couldn't figure out what to do about it. And so with that, it's come all these changes that happen with technology where the products are changing so rapidly. So it's more like what's happened to our phones because governments haven't been able to prevent it from happening. Uh, so they're getting ever better, they're segmenting the market. We're getting consumers deciding how to use a product. And one of the fascinating things now is that, as some of my more abstinence-oriented uh, colleagues are saying, my God, there's non-smokers who are using vaping. Well, talk to the non-smokers who are using vaping. And what you'll find is either, they, in, in almost all cases, there's no nicotine involved, and they're using it for something they have found to be valuable that they probably learned about from social media. A classic one is, replacing calories. So you vape a flavor rather than eat a dessert. So people who have been told by their doctor, you're, you're a borderline diabetic, you need to lose weight, and the person says, but I love cherry cheesecake. Vape cherry cheesecake. Just swirl around your mouth, you're not inhaling into your lungs, you're using your taste buds. And some people find it works for them, so they tell their friends. Other people do it. That's what happens with technology, and you need to pay attention to consumers to see where it's gonna go. The same as, you know, our phones, People used to think phones were things people used to talk on. But as we got to mobile phones and innovators came out and consumers decided what to do, I mean, how many of us actually spend any time talking on our phones compared to all the other things that we're doing? Uh, people will decide how this market's going to go. And one of the great things about this area is that because the existing market is so huge and the customers are so dissatisfied, so if you've got $800 billion a year being spent by people who would prefer not to be spending the money on that, it's sort of like, you know, how would you feel if you're in East Germany having to dri drive Trabants and you're already spending lots of money to buy the damn things and now the, the walls come down? There, there, there's a business opportunity there. Uh, and in this case, there's a business opportunity there. This is a self-financing public health revolution that allows some people to make billions of dollars saving millions of lives, except for the problem that we've got government standing in the way. So what's our role as lawyers? Well, I think one of the things that we can do is recognize the problem innovative technology has had from the beginning. Um, Eric Schmidt in his uh, book, How Google Works, talks about this, the red flag rules. A red flag rule is where we subject, and it goes back to uh, the 1800s where as automobiles came out, people thought, oh my gosh, this could be awful, so we'll just, we'll pass a law that you can use an automobile, but you have to have somebody walking in front of it, waving a red flag. And you can't go more than two miles an hour in a city or more than four miles an hour in the countryside uh, because we need to protect people from this. And it's the tendency to subject new technology to a higher safety standard than the technology it's meant to, to replace. And they worry about it in terms of things like self-driving cars. You know, the first time somebody's injured or killed in a self-driving car, which will happen, will government regulators bounce you know, all over it in order to try to protect us. And, and the problem of how much of what we do to try to protect the public actually ends up doing exactly the opposite. So how do you avoid that sort of thing from happening? Well, part of that, I think, comes down to what we can do with law in not just lobbying governments and, and, and getting publicity to get people to think about this, to get consumers to speak out, but also the role of the Constitution. So if we look at uh, uh, issues like what happened with the Insight Safe Injection Site in uh, uh, in Vancouver, where our Supreme Court decided it was a violation of Section 7 to prevent people from being able to use that site, uh, right to life. You got people who are addicted, addictions and illness, and you're forcing them to deal with that in a way that was much more likely to cause them harm and death. And that was unconstitutional. You know, in R. N. Smith on uh, medical marijuana. So the government says, yeah, you can smoke marijuana, we won't let you get it in another way violation of section 7. Well, this is sort of interesting. Why is it? Well, if you have to smoke the marijuana, it's going to be much more hazardous than, than getting your THC in another way. Why wouldn't somebody be able to get it in another way? And you say, well, so if somebody's using something for a medicinal purpose like self-medicating, they should be able to get it in a less hazardous way. If somebody's addicted to a drug, they should be able to get it in a less hazardous way. Well, What's the potential of using those sorts of arguments to say, you still got five million Canadians who are using a product they don't want to be using, has about a 50% chance of eventually killing them. We have an alternative that's available, and they're not being allowed to get access to it. They're not being given truthful information about it. And how's that sit with Section 7 of our, our, our Charter of Rights? Uh, 
you know, what's the ability to use something like that in order to try to, to overturn the thinking or to generate new thinking on this to essentially solve a problem? And I think that we're on the verge of being able to, to leverage the innovative technology we have now to get the sort of breakthrough that we've seen in other issues of, of public health. You know, the, the reason that we eventually did get things like the Green Revolution or uh, the eradication of smallpox or uh, pure water, uh, that there's a chance for a phenomenal breakthrough. The science is really, really clear. The demand is there. The market exists. We're seeing what the solution can be, and we know the products we have now, you know, 10 years from now are going to look like flip phones look to us now. It will change if we allow it to happen. It's a matter of opening that up to allow it to happen, and the role that, that we in dealing with, uh, uh, with law, with policy, can, can play in causing that to happen. Thanks. I think we're here, we're here to talk about disruptive technologies, but I think the more I think about this, um, the more I realize that actually a disruptive technology is really just the most successful example of a new technology uh, because really everything is basically disruptive. Um, and the, the distinguishing feature, if you like, is that as um, we were just heard, the, the government isn't in the way to prevent that disruption and that development. Um, and it reminds me of that joke that... Uh, Ronald Reagan used to tell about the uh, about, about buying a car in the Soviet Union, and you know it used to be a huge, long-winded process. Not only because there was a shortage of cars, but you know you had to have government permission to buy a car. And so you know this guy wanted a car, and he'd been waiting for ages, and he'd finally got permission. And he went to the dealer after being in the you know the the, the wait to get permission for nine months, and he put his deposit down and then he said, okay, now there's a nine month wait until the car arrives. So come back on November 3rd and you can pick up the car. And the guy says, uh, oh, well, should I come in the morning or the afternoon? And the guy says, well, it's nine months away. Does it really matter whether it's the morning or afternoon? And the guy says, well, yeah, the plumber's coming in the afternoon. <laughs> so um, uh, my name's Peter McCaffrey. I'm the research director at the Manning Center. I actually work for the charitable wing, the Manning Foundation, where we do all the research and the, the policy. Um, I've given this speech a couple of times, but as is the uh, nature with disruptive technology, and I have to change it every time because the technology keeps changing and I have to keep updating it and adding new things that are going on. So um, I first became interested in ride sharing uh, very early on, perhaps 2011, I think might have been around about when I first heard of it, uh, when these things were just getting going in San Francisco. Um, and I first took a ride myself in an Uber in early 2013 in San Diego. In fact, you can see from here, it was June 15th, 2013 at 8.34. And the very fact that I still have this receipt in my email inbox is an interesting point in itself that we come, can come back to a little bit later as part of the convenience. But I, was, I just suddenly realized, oh wait, I can actually look up when I first used an Uber. I just typed in Uber receipt and I went to the oldest one. Um, now, you've probably seen a short clip from this video, but I think it's worth watching the whole thing to actually listen to the guy's argument. Um, so if we can play this, and hopefully it's not too loud. This guy, no this guy don't have no, no insurance. This guy me, man. He don't have nothing, man. This guy, got a, this guy got no insurance. This guy, he's a no license, nothing. Watch yourself. No, you kill me. I didn't. Go. Go. This, this, this guy, he's a Box, this no is Yeah, this is <laughs> You know, this is <laughs> <a laughs> This is <laughs> box, no, no insurance, nothing, you know? He's Honda Civic. He has 9,000 insurance, you know that? This is <laughs> This is <laughs> Nothing. You know, look at this, look at this. Look at the driver, look at the driver. Look at the, look at the driver. This is a Uber X. Well, how do you know? Look at the customer in the back. Look at the customer in the back. Yeah, that's a computer number. Oh my god! Stop it! No, That's he, crazy. See, he, he doesn't. Why would you do that? He doesn't have it. Like he goes, he don't want to talk to you. But why are you gra he, I being dragged by his car? Don't you know? I think that's enough. So you see, they don't have insurance. 
They're just regular cars. They're very dangerous, right? This guy's primary concern is safety. Now, all of this pales in comparison to what we saw in Paris recently, where protesters threw bricks off bridges onto Uber cars after they drove underneath. They tipped Uber cars over and set them on fire. And just other general rioting is, you know, is a bit more normal in Paris. Um, but again, I think this clip is very important to actually listen to what the, what the taxi drivers say when they're interviewed in the media. And it's, it's translated in here. The taxi strike by thousands of drivers across the country created traffic I'll just jams, sorry. travel chaos. It's not letting me skip through. Uh, I'll, I'll just open the video up because I don't want you to have to watch the whole thing, but I'll just skip through to the, the interview with the taxi driver. The taxi strike by thousands of drivers across... Get your bleep to the airport, W... <laughs> Here we go. Our rules are strict. We buy our licenses and they cost a lot. We can't do what we want. We don't decide on our rates. We don't decide on our days of work. And now we have people who pay nothing, who have no training, and who run a taxi service with... Sorry, I didn't realize it wasn't showing, but you, you get the idea. Um, if I can get this to go up again. So we go, the technology panel has the technology trouble, isn't it? Um, so the, the guy says, our rules are very strict. We buy our licenses, they cost a lot, we can't do what we want, we don't decide on our rates, we don't decide on our days of work. The important point to realize here is not that he was arguing that he should be allowed to do all those things. He was arguing that the other people shouldn't be allowed to do that. They also, shouldn't be, they also should have to pay a lot and they shouldn't be allowed to choose when they work and they shouldn't be allowed to set their rates. So it's not, I want freedom to compete equally with them, it's they should not be allowed to do something I can't do. And then a final clip, back to Toronto for a second, uh, you probably didn't see this part of the video. So what are you hoping to accomplish today? Yeah, Jan Tori, he's uh, going to tell them he's not listening, he's, uh, he's something behind, he got to put him a snitch line but for him. He says he's listening, he says he's, he's trying listening. to get something he's done. He's just yapping, he's, that's he's all he's doing. Like hey, the law is the law, he's on the book. Law is on the book. If dead about the law, we shouldn't be the problem right now. That's right. The yes, law right? is on the book, yeah, my yeah, man. Uber, city, Uber, you know, Uber, Uber, Uber is going to be like ISIS, my friend. Uber is ISIS. You know what ISIS means? Well, Uber is hey, ISIS, my that's man. That's going a little bit yeah. too far, my yeah, friend. Uber is ISIS, I, man. They're yeah, bringing money. Yeah, yeah. Bring so, I, w I won't touch the ISIS part, but clearly you can see they're quite angry and their main point is the law is the law, therefore it should be enforced. Okay, so let's take a step back. What, <laughs> yes. what, what is the sharing economy? So uh, the actual phrase, the sharing economy, was concept, uh, was concept for quite a while, but it was championed by uh, Rachel Botsman and Rue Rogers in a 2010 book, What's Mine is Yours, The Rise of Collaborative Consumption. And they described it as a revolution that allows people to create value out of shared and open resources in ways that balance personal self-interest with the good of the larger community. Uh, of course, that's completely nonsense. Um, what the sharing economy really is, is private property rights, uh, voluntary re le the legalization of voluntary transactions between consenting adults, and a general lack of interference by government regulations. Now, these voluntary interactions can be paid or unpaid, as we'll see in some of the examples later, but the key is that it's voluntary transactions and, and that kind of relationship. So. The primary example I'll, I'll use here is Uber. Uh, they've currently raised $10 billion in uh, funds uh, for at a valuation of more than $62 billion. Uh, their main competitor is uh, Lyft, who've raised $2 billion for a valuation of more than $10 billion. Um, some of the other com one of the other companies, Sidecar, they actually shut down on December 31st because they raised only $35 million. Um, there are plenty of others, uh, Uber and Lyft are the primary ones in the ride sharing uh, area. In the other areas of the um, sharing economy, we have a whole bunch of apps that do very similar things for different services. So I'll very quickly run through them so you get an idea of the general scope of what can be done with these types of apps and, and how it works. So Airbnb is the other one that a lot of people have heard of. It's essentially Uber for accommodation. If you're going away, you can rent out your house to someone for a few nights. If you're visiting a city, you can rent their house for a few nights. Um, it's strange because that seemed very strange a few years ago, and now that's like the normal one in this list. Um, Spinlister is bike sharing, same sort of thing, rent your bike out to someone. 
Uh, TaskRabbit is essentially task sharing. You pay someone to do some jobs for you, uh, including things like delivery, which we'll get back to. Uh, Lending Club is finance. Uh, FON is an interesting one because this was a very early one um, where it was if you shared your own home Wi-Fi publicly using a secure sort of setup, you would then be able to, anywhere you went, find another FON user and use their Wi-Fi. Uh, this has mostly been succeeded by everyone having much better cell phones with much better data plans now. So it's actually quite uncommon now. But it's an example of where one of the original disruptors has now been disrupted by cell phone companies dropping the prices of cell phone data plans. Um, Eatwith, I think this one sounds like the one I'd want to do most. Uh, this is like Airbnb, but instead of staying the night, you just have a meal. And so you can allow people to come into your house and cook for them. Uh, or you can go to someone else's house and they can cook for you. Uh, now obviously there's some quite interesting regu regulatory aspects to this around health and safety legislation and you know, you're not getting food poisoning and things like that. But what they've found the primary use has been for this is chefs who work in a restaurant where the rules are very strict about what they have to cook, the menus are very set, they're not allowed to innovate or come up with new dishes or anything like that, but the chefs want to practice new dishes so that they can try and get a new job later on. So they will invite people in for very cheap meals, they'll practice their skills on, try out all sorts of new dishes, get feedback from the guests as to what works and what doesn't. Um, Canary is basically Uber for weed. Uh, you dial up the app in the states where weed is legal in the US and they will deliver some uh, marijuana to you. Uh, dog vacay is a dog sitter for when you're going on vacation you can leave your dog with someone else. There are also similar websites for cats and lizards and <laughs> all sorts of other animals. Um, this one is very, uh, I, I like this one. StubHub is actually quite an old website. It may even be the oldest one on this list. And a lot of people I don't think would traditionally think of this as being the sharing economy. But you're essentially sharing your tickets to an event. And particularly in the case of, say, a season ticket where you can't make every game, it's very similar sort of thing where you have unallocated, unused resources. Uh, there's an interesting legal aspect for those of you in the room who are lawyers here in that you, it's not a physical product that you own. With a ticket, you're purchasing a license to a seat at an event. And so if you're a strict libertarian, you might back the, um, the uh, venue um, owners or the, the sporting team in their argument that, hey, you can't resell this to whoever you want because it says in the license and the terms and conditions when you do this, you're not allowed to. Um, but equally interesting, the uh, response by um, professional sports leagues and venues to StubHub was not to try and legislate them out of practice, but actually just to set up their own ticket exchanges, and now that's much more common. And this has basically been a non-issue because that was the approach that the teams took. Uh, this is my favorite example. Um, monkey parking, um, th there are several apps that let you rent out private parking spaces. So, you know, I have an apartment and I don't use the parking spot so I can rent it out to someone. Monkey parking lets you rent out public parking spots in cities. And basically the way it works is um, you go on the app and you're looking for a parking spot and you look for another monkey parking person who, has currently, who is currently occupying a public parking spot and you can pay them to leave that spot. <laughs> or if you're in one, you will receive a notification saying someone wants your public parking spot and you can get paid to leave it so that they can go in. Now, <laughs> cities didn't really like this. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I love what the, the founder said. He said, I have the right to tell people if I'm about to leave a parking spot and they have the right to pay me for such information. So I imagine if I was a lawyer, I would love this statement even more than I do it right now because essentially what he's saying is you're not paying for the parking spot, you're paying for the information about when I'm gonna leave. And if I happen to hang around an extra couple of minutes because you're not here yet, then fine. Um, this got banned in San Francisco, Boston, LA, all over the place. The reaction by city councils was even swifter than Uber. Um, there was no real public backing, perhaps because it hadn't caught on yet, but also perhaps because it's just insane. Um, <laughs> Uh, and in the end, uh, Monkey Parking decided that they just weren't well funded enough to fight this, and so they ended up relaunching with a slightly different business model where they sell now parking spots on private driveways 
rather than a parking, private parking spot, they sell them parking in private driveways and they have an interesting algorithm to work out who should park at the front and who should park at the back and things like that. But I think it's a shame because I, I like this attitude of, no, shove it, we're, we're not selling parking spots, we're selling information. Um, so back to, uh, that, that's the wider sharing economy. Now back to ride sharing specifically. Uh, today I'm going to mostly refer to Uber. Um, that's just, oh, hang on. Uh, that, that's just because they're the largest company, they're the most well known, they operate specifically here in Toronto and more broadly in Canada, so people, it's more relatable, people have experience with them. Uh, but I think all of the technology and regulation and rules equally apply to the other ride sharing companies uh, or to the other wider um, uh, sharing economy apps that we've, we've just gone through. So let's have a look at the type of services that Uber offer. Uh, Uber Black is the original service they first launched with. Uh, it's nicer cars, modeled on a limo service. The requirement for being uh, an Uber Black driver requires a much higher standard of car and there's stricter regulations for getting signed onto the, onto the app and things like that. Uh, they have Uber Lux, which is even fancier. Um, I've categorized this as Uber Other because they have all sorts of other products that they've started segmenting into since I last did this. So there's SUV, there's XL if you've got loads of people traveling together. The Select, which is kind of in between UberX and the Uber Black. Um, they've uh, just started rolling out wheelchair, uh, wheelchair accessible vehicles in a bunch of places, which is a, um, something that they'd said they'd been working on but had been a huge hammer that a lot of cities had hit them with and said, you know, well, you're not providing wheelchair accessible services, you know, classic free market, just um, taking money from you know, people who can afford to pay and not servicing a wide array of people. Uh, they ended up launching the wheelchair accessible vehicles at the same cost as an UberX, so they're undercutting the taxi company still by 40% in that area and they're still making money off them. Um, and there's some interesting studies as well, I don't think I'm going to have time to get into this, but if you look at some of like say New York, the areas that Uber s tends to service is a lot more of the poorer areas of the various suburbs and areas of uh, New York, whereas for a lot of those uh, types of uh, people they really struggle to get taxi service, so they've had huge benefits from that. Uh, and then interestingly Uber Taxi, in a few cities, uh, and th I think Toronto as well, I've never tried it here because um, why would you <laughs> use an Uber taxi when you could even use an UberX? But um, you can actually order a taxi via the Uber app and basically the taxi companies are contracting to Uber to, provide, to use their technology. Uh, which if you've, if you've ever used a taxi company's proprietary app, you might understand why a smart taxi company would want to do this. Um, and then UberX. So this is the, their lower end product. It's um, the one that's getting all the attention. It's the one that's got the cheap price, 40% less than taxi or whatever the, the most recent rate is. Uh, and this is the one that's really caused all the arguments and the anger because it's the one that's undercutting the market and taking all the market share. So this is regular people, most of them driving part time in regular cars. There's a few restrictions. I think the car has to be at least five or max seven years old, depending on the city. And the exact rules vary uh, depending on city regulations, Uber own policies, etc. But so the real question is why is everyone so mad at Uber? And the simple answer is because it's popular, really, really popular. Um, I like to note that the, the sort of the left wing social activists really loved the sharing economy a few years ago. Back when it was all unpaid voluntary transactions, and it was people giving someone a ride to work because you happen to be going the same way, this was like the darling of the left. City councils would spend millions of dollars on promoting these programs. Um, in fact, if you look through various cities, a lot of them still have references to these programs on their website about how great it is to share rides and how you know, it's not actually that bad to share a ride with a stranger because you'll get to have interesting experiences and all this kind of stuff and how actually Canada's a very safe place and you know, all this kind of stuff. So none of the safety concerns were a problem when it was free. But as soon as someone actually invented some technology that allowed them to commercialize this, uh, to make ride sharing into a profitable business, and uh, in the process actually make it a feasible business, uh, then council started banning it. And the, the problem I guess with ride sharing is you have to have that technology in order to connect the individuals, in order to 
create a critical mass of uh, cars that are available to actually make it an option for someone who would want to take it and, and it be a reliable service. I'll come back to that in a little second. So the taxi drivers and the taxi companies are mad because Uber is taking a huge chunk of their business away from them. Uh, just uh, this week, a taxi company filed for bankruptcy in San Francisco. It's the first one. Uh, first, sorry, first major taxi companies to come, and specifically because of ride-sharing. Uh, it's an interesting portent of what might be to come, given Uber launched first in San Francisco back in 2010, and so it'll be interesting to see how this flows through in a lot of other cities. Um, for the last couple of years, Uber have made the argument that actually they've grown the pie, that um, they are offering more rides per day than the entire ind taxi industry put together were offering per day before Uber launched. And that was true, they'd grown the market, far more people were taking rides, probably because more people could afford it. And so Uber had grown that market, but I suspect they've become even more popular now and, and even though the market is growing, they're still eating into the existing market as well. So then the next obvious question is why is Uber taking all of their business? Why is it so much better? Um, in, in Calgary, Uber launched in October, finally, um, and we had it for about a week and a half before the uh, city council and our ultra progressive mayor, Ninchi, who's supposedly such a fan of Uber, decided to take them to court. Um, I won't get into the details of the court case because um, you know, we've had enough law for the weekend. Um, <laughs> but um, essentially we're hoping that it'll get negotiated and figured out and it'll be launched back in February. But suffice to say, I've had enough experience with Uber and Lyft in other cities uh, to personally know the answer to why Uber's taking all of their taxi businesses. So let, let's give you an example of a typical taxi experience. Um, maybe you call them on the phone on a Friday night. You can't get through. You try again. You can't get through. You call them again. Oh, you got through. OK, now I'm on hold for 10 minutes. Uh, they finally pick up. You ask them for a taxi, you give them the address, they don't know where the address is, you give them the address again. They said, oh, okay, all right, it'll be 10 minutes, maybe 15, definitely no more than 30 minutes. So, uh, an hour later, you're still waiting. You call back, they say, oh, sorry, the taxi couldn't find you, they left. So they, send you not, they said, we'll send you another one, it'll be you know, 15 minutes. It's like, no, no, I'll, I'll, you finally managed to flag one down off the street, which you should have tried in the first place probably in turn stealing that from someone else who'd ordered that taxi because that taxi driver didn't want to drive all the way to pick up that person, they just wanted to get the ride from you immediately. Um, and then you get inside and it's an old car and it smells and it sounds like it's about to fall apart and as you're, as you're driving off, the driver almost crashes into another car or a pedestrian or a cyclist or something. On the way home they talk on their cell phone or they play rap music the whole way uh, nothing against rap music. Um, and then when you get home, you pull out your credit card, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, the credit card machine isn't working. Yeah, yeah you've had that one? Yeah, yeah. And then you say, oh, well, I, I don't have any cash. And it, oh, magically, the credit card machine is working again. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, that, that sounds familiar, right? OK. Um, so maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I don't think that's that far off a typical taxi experience. Occasionally you'll get a bit lucky and you have a better experience and, and it'll be nice. Sometimes you'll get unlucky and you'll have an even worse experience where the cab just never shows up and you walk home, or where you actually crash into something, or where the car actually breaks down on the way, or where the credit card really truly is actually broken and you have to drive around with the taxi driver looking for an ATM all while the meter's still running. All of those things have happened to me. Um, and I have one more personal story for you, uh, which I threw in just for this one. I, I arrived in Toronto for this conference, and I took the uh, fancy new public subsidized train down to Union Station. That's a different speech. Um, <laughs> and, and for a moment, I considered getting a taxi, because you, know, you walk out of Union Station, there's a taxi rank there. But first, there's a crowd of taxi drivers that you have to wade through, because the crowd of taxi drivers are trying to get you to go with them rather than the first one on the rank. They want to take you back to their cab so they don't have to wait in line. So you wade through them and you go to the first taxi in line. And I, uh, you know, and, and I tried to get in the back and it was locked. And so he wound down his window and he said, oh, where are you going? And I was like, well, you're not technically allowed to ask me that because you're not allowed to decide whether you give me a ride based on where, where I'm going, whether it's far enough for, you to, for it to be worthwhile you um, giving up your spot in line. But I gave him the address and he said, oh, I don't know where that is. <laughs> 
<laughs> Chelsea Hotel, okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, in hindsight, he probably did know exactly where it was. It was just a convenient way of not giving me the ride and waiting until someone else wanted to go somewhere further. But at this point, I gave up and I said, you know what, don't worry about it. I'm going to go get an Uber. I went back inside and I did what I should have done all the way along. Um, so, so by contrast to these stories, Uber typically offers a far faster response time, a convenient app that just works, nice newish cars, polite, safe drivers, the convenience of it all just coming off your credit card automatically. And I don't know if any of you have uh, managed to try this yet. I finally got to use it a couple of days ago. But if the driver is using the latest version of the Uber app now, you can control their music. So on your phone, on your app, you pick the song you want, and it streams over the internet. It comes out there. Stereo. Brilliant. Um, they have to be using the latest version yet, but brilliant. So now, sure, there's, there's the odd driver who isn't so good. They go a bit too fast, or they get lost, or something like that. But if you're in a taxi, there is no recourse. You just have to suffer that, right? You have to hope you're not going to die in a tragic accident. Um, in Uber, you rate the driver after the trip. You can complain. Uh, you can get a partial or full refund if the guy went the wrong way. And more importantly, in the long run, if an Uber driver's rating drops below a four out of five, they get kicked off the app unless there's some particularly extenuating circumstances. So it's, it's not actually that the drivers are just inherently better on Uber, it's that they have better technology, better reporting mechanisms, and better accountability mechanisms to improve the standards of the service. And there's a few articles floating around on the internet at the moment talking about how taxi service in London or taxi service in New York has improved because of the competition, uh, competition uh, from Uber. Theoretically, with my economics background, I should believe that, but I really don't, having still taken taxis in those cities since then. But you know, we'll, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. So what are the policy implications? Uh, well, so I, I, I'm assuming everyone has a broad understanding of the, the, the policy, uh, the current policy situation, which is basically that local governments regulate the hell out of the taxi industry. Uh, they limit the number of taxis that are allowed in each city. They regulate minimum prices. Um, they regulate the, the per minute price, the, the distance price, the, all sorts of requirements like that. There are even requirements for things like the, the, the taxi companies must have the head office in the city. They must have a, a call center. You must be able to order a cab by phone. You can't only offer an app. They mu you must have phone support so you can call up. Um, I, I assume it's just that you must have a phone number, not, not that you must actually answer the phone. Um, <laughs> um, but it's, it's essentially it's your classic public choice problem of special interests and rent seeking where you have a small group of people deriving a very large benefit from a bunch of regulations, but the vast majority of people are only paying a small cost for that. Um, and, and, and up until Uber, this was a, an almost intractable problem because of the politics around this. Think tanks have spent decades trying to figure out how to fix this industry. How do we get around this cronyism? How do we get around these regulations? How do we fix this? I remember going to a conference in about 2009 when I just finished, oh, I was still a student at that time, and there was a fantastic presentation by a young guy who'd come up with a new innovative way around the taxi companies. And, and at the time, the solution was, uh, this new idea was to actually inflate away the licenses. So if you have 400 licenses in a city and you want to issue more licenses, say another 100, instead of the city selling those 100 to 100 new drivers, Let's give each of the existing 400 license holders another quarter of a license and then allow them to share, uh, to trade those shares of licenses on a market to the point where if they buy another three quarters, they have another license, they can operate another cab. Uh, and then you can keep inflating it away. You offer another 100 the next year, another 100 the next year. And it doesn't solve the issue for the drivers individually because they're still losing out in the long run, but it kind of blunts the impact for them. And this was proposed as the novel new way of trying to get around the taxi industry. And less than a year later, Uber launched and just blew the whole thing away uh, with the approach that we heard about earlier of basically just ignoring all the rules, which in hindsight was a lot better. But at the time in 2009, this sounded like a really interesting idea. So um, the policy implications, as I've said here, is that the regulatory rules prevent the innovation that we heard about. They slow down the changes. Um, the, I think the interesting question for me is that given the experience of what we've seen with Uber and these other apps, will 
uh, municipal governments, provincial governments, federal governments actually be able to successfully legislate against many of these things in the future? And I think that's still an open-ended question, but I think maybe the, the evidence is leaning towards no in a lot of these cases. Um, so a little more into the theory of um, why we saw this change. When you're um, a less modern society and people tend to live in small communities, you have a lot more trust because you know your community, you know your neighbours, you know the people you live with. And, and individuals have a level of trust about indiv every individual because you know everyone and you know who you can trust and who you can't. When we started moving to cities and people started living much more densely and there's far more people around and things like that, you can't know all of your neighbours, therefore the traditional trust mechanisms don't work. You can't know whether the guy driving your taxi is trustworthy or not because there are tens of thousands of taxi drivers and you don't know them all. What the technology has enabled is for those trust mechanisms to return in a slightly different way through things like reviews and ratings. So that when you rate your Uber driver, you are sending a signal to all of the future users of that driver that this person is trustworthy. And if you ordered an Uber and the guy comes up and he's got a two out of five, you could cancel that and wait and get someone else, right? I don't think you're gonna get anyone that's two out of five because they kick them off if they go uh, below four, four or three and point eight or whatever it is. But in theory, you, you have that choice as a consumer to pick someone who you know broadly um, is trustworthy. And you see the same with online review sites for restaurants and all the sorts of, same sorts of things like that. Obviously there's technological challenges with reviews as well, but that's the theory behind it. Now on the economic side, the reason why ride sharing and the sharing economy works in general is mostly efficiency. Buying a car is very expensive uh, and using it for a couple of days, uh, a couple of hours a day is incredibly inefficient. Uh, those of you who've done some economics and those Coase theorem, the key to more efficient allocation of resources isn't government directing resource allocation or anything like that, and it isn't inherently pricing mechanisms, it's actually reducing transaction costs to allow for pricing mechanisms to uh, trend towards the most accurate price. The problem has been that transaction costs were very high. The transaction costs of sharing a ride before Uber were moral hazard, the unease, the lack of trust, uh, the difficulty of matching buyers with sellers that I talked about earlier where you're trying to find someone who's going in the right direction. Um, and you can talk about things like hitchhiking, um, which you know has uh, some level of that, but again, no level of trust. So most people, in most circumstances, ended up buying their own car rather than renting or sharing because the transaction costs of sharing were just too high. But the internet has started to eliminate a lot of those costs. Um, another little thing I inserted in here as well is I think it's interesting to note the franchise model. I haven't really looked into this enough, but I suspect that because of the heavy regulation of the taxi industry, that's why you see taxi companies only operating in one city. Sure, an individual rich person might own licenses in multiple cities, but the actual taxi companies tend to only operate in one city. And that's because they have to comply with all of the regulations. Many cities require your head office to be in the city that you're operating, things like that. What Uber and apps allow is for an almost franchise type system where wherever you travel, wherever you go, you have a recognizable brand that you trust. You pull out the same app to get an Uber in Toronto as you do in Calgary or San Diego or wherever. You don't have to download the new taxi company's app for the new city that you're in. You don't have to find the phone number for the local tax company and things like that. And you have a bit of a guarantee around quality controls. You know that Uber has the similar standards for the quality of the vehicle in each city. And you know that if the driver goes the wrong way and it costs you too much, you can email their helpline and get a refund depend regardless of which city. And so there's some standardization of what people are expecting across the industry in there as well. So a little more into the politics. This has been an old article now, but it's very interesting if you want to look it up. Uh, will the sharing economy make us all Republicans? Not that I'm a Republican, but um, it was a very interesting article, and uh, I'll read one little ex uh, excerpt from it. It was, uh, Re Republicans understandably salivate at the sight of liberals for once, railing against government overreach, excessive licensing requirements, taxes and safety regulations, threatening a service that they love. 
Is it too much of a stretch to hope that these rideshare fans might rise up to oppose similar government-imposed obstacles facing plenty of other American businesses like power utilities, financial companies, industrial manufacturers, and other companies like Uber? Uh, the article went on to conclude, no, they probably won't. <laughs> but it was an interesting idea anyway. And I, I, I think maybe in the long run, there is some truth to this. Uh, if you look at the development of the internet, younger generations expect choice and they expect variety and they expect that on-demand service of you know you can go to YouTube and you can watch the music video you want to watch you don't have to wait for MTV to decide to show the music video back when MTV showed music a um, couple of quotes from Lyft and Uber CEOs um, John Zimmer said that uh, cities interpret laws one way and are trying to do their job we interpret laws another way and are trying to innovate if we took the approach of, hey, let's wait and see what the government does to create a path that's very clear, we wouldn't be operating anywhere. And Travis Kalanick, the head of Uber, said, uh, stand by your principles and be comfortable with confrontation. So few people are that when the people with the red tape come, it becomes a negotiation. And he might as well have said the second quote, which you might recognize. So, um, I've got a couple of examples here of things that Uber have launched recently, and then a couple of examples of things that might be coming up in future. Um, Corner Store is great. Um, I can't remember which cities they've launched this in. I know it's in San Francisco and New York. It might be a couple of others now. Basically, instead of asking your Uber driver to go and pick you up and take you somewhere, you ask your Uber driver to go to a store, buy you things, and bring the things back to your house. Um, Uber Fresh, or I think in, in Toronto it's called Uber Eats, they bring you lunch. So they have a separate app with a whole set of menus from different restaurants where you can order lunch. Not that food delivery is particularly novel, but um, it's interesting that they're kind of branching out in some of these areas. Uh, Uber Rush is now in New York. It's essentially a courier service. So they have these by cars, but they also have cyclists going around with the Uber Rush app. And rather than calling up UPS to get something delivered across town, you call up Uber and they do it, you know, really quickly. Um, from a policy perspective, Uber Pool is very interesting. So if you've ever used like an airport van, where you're at the airport, you want to go to your hotel, rather than paying the $70 taxi to go to your hotel, you get in a van with three or four other people and they go around to the four different hotels that you're going to and you share the price and it's twenty dollars or something like that. That's, that service is reasonably easy to provide when there's a single point of origin and multiple points of drop off. Or when you're going to the airport there are multiple points of pickup but a single destination. What Uber Pool has done though is used Uber's really complex algorithms that they have to decide which cabs should pick up which people. And they've adapted the algorithms to allow for multi-point pickup to multi-point drop-off. So it doesn't have to be to or from an airport. You can call up, and as long as you tick the option saying, I'm willing to share the ride, they will route a slightly larger Uber vehicle around to pick up several people and drop off several other people. And so Trevor Kalanis, uh, Calcanis, the CEO, has said he envisages a point where, particularly when they get driverless vehicles, but even before then, um, where these cars could be on the road 20 out of 24 hours a day, different drivers perhaps even, but throughout that whole time they never have less than two people in them because their routing algorithm is so good that they know where to go to pick up the next person before they drop off the next person before they pick up the next person. Because there's no need to pick up five people and then drop five people off if the route is such that you can pick two people up, drop one off, pick two people up, drop two off, pick three people up, drop one off, all along the same route. And Uber Hop, which is in Toronto and Seattle, I think, is basically a bus, but using the Uber technology. And so they have looked at several routes that they feel are underserved by the Toronto Transportation TTC. And they have said for $5, instead of us coming to your door, you walk a maximum of three blocks to a common pickup spot. And we will pick up two or three or four or five people all at that spot. These are using private vehicles 
larger cars rather than actual large buses. But then all of you will go to a common drop-off spot in the other, area, the other end of town. And so they've got four or five different routes. So you have them uh, innovating one way to say, we'll pick up everyone from everywhere using our algorithm. And you have them simplifying the other way to say, well, we'll just walk, everyone walk to this one point and we'll pick you up and then we'll drop you off in a single point. And they're experimenting with all these different uh, ways of providing cheap service. But with a combination of Uber Pool and Uber Hop, they've got prices for rides across town down to $5. You throw driverless vehicles into there and you're talking about it being cheaper than, private, uh, than public transit. So at that point, how does public transit work? Maybe you have an argument for heavy infrastructure like subways and LRTs, but at, at what point do you start saying, well, hang on, there's no point providing buses at all because Uber can do this for cheaper whenever people want from door to door rather than point to point along a set specific route. Um, and I mentioned a couple of times uh, self-driving cars or driverless cars. Uh, this is an interesting innovation. Uber are working on it. Lyft just signed a 500 million deal with uh, General Motors uh, to work on some driverless cars for Lyft and for GM. Um, the real innovation here is that the reason public transit works, particularly buses, is because you can afford to pay the driver if you have a large vehicle that can transport multiple people. But other than that, the actual capital costs of a large bus are very high. If you can have an autonomous vehicle that carries two, three, four people, it's far more efficient. So again, the self-driving cars talk is a completely separate talk, but it's interesting to think about the potential implications of self-driving cars on Uber and to consider who might end up owning cars. Do individuals bother buying cars? I don't think anyone's going to suggest outlawing private people buying cars. But would you bother if you can get a ride anywhere you want for cheaper than public transit in a private vehicle? Um, if you did own a private car, would you lease it to Uber in the 22 hours a day that you're not using it so it can make money for you? So you, know, you, you have the car at home, you drive to work. While you're at work, instead of paying for parking, your car makes you money by driving around the city transporting other people. <laughs> and you program into it, well, I'm leaving work at four, so please be back by four, and it picks you up and takes you home. And then while you're at home watching the game, it goes out and takes people to bars and restaurants and things like that, and then comes back and it's earning you money. So it's some interesting thought material for you, but that really is a separate uh, talk. Um, in conclusion, um, I hear our opening speaker, Justice Stratus, can quote South Park. Now, I tell you what, it's very hard to find a South Park clip that can be used in polite company. <laughs> um, but I think I found one, so let's give it a go. Nobody takes jobs away from us. We need to speak to Mayor and tell her to shut down this illegitimate business. Or maybe we could have the police shut him down. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't you guys just make your cars cleaner and nicer and try to be better to your customers so that you can compete with handy cars popularity in the marketplace? Just ignore my friend. He's mentally disabled. Ah, uh, don't mind me. <laughs> so, uh, compulsory promo. If you haven't signed up for Ruby yet, there's my promo code. You get like $15 free ride. Uh, please have a look at the Manning Center website. It's also the Manning Foundation website. Now they're combined. Um, some of the other stuff we do is council tracker. Where we track what councils are up to. And we have the Manning Center conference at the end of February if you'd like to come in Ottawa. Thank you. I, I have to just uh, say uh, something, a uh, personal anecdote here. Adam and I have been traveling together for the CCF to, uh, to Toronto for a number of years. And uh, one of the first times that we came here, we took a cab from the airport and uh, we got in an accident along, along the road. And it was kind of odd because it happened so quickly. We didn't really know what was going on. And then the driver was suddenly trying to get me to like testify on his behalf on the street as he got into a fist fight with somebody else that he had hit. Another cabbie, by the way. So that was a kind of a bizarre experience. And then uh, last time we were here, we took Uber. And it was a young driver, it was Uber X, I believe, is a young driver who was going to take us to the airport. And he kind of got lost along the way. <laughs> And he, uh, it took us maybe 15 minutes longer, and he felt so bad he gave us the ride for free. So uh, our two experiences are getting into an accident and being dragged into the fist fight, 
and then getting a ride for free because it was perhaps unsatisfactory to us. So, so yeah, it's uh, incentives, right? So uh, anyone have any questions? I think there's lots of interesting stuff to ask about. Uh, so vaping and healthcare policy and uh, the economics of that, very interesting stuff, what should be done. And then uh, with Uber, as you've just heard, so have at her, let's hear some questions. Yeah, that's what a great panel. Um, I, David, I had a question for you um, about the reaction of tobacco companies to vaping, because I've heard two very different things. I've had, I've had some, some people, and I, I think some vaping shop owners have told us this when we met with them, say, you know, the tobacco companies, this is, this is competition and they hate it and they will do anything to shut us down. But then I've spoken to some t tobacco company people, granted, um, I think they were British rather than um, Canadian or American, and they, they told me how, how into, <laughs> if you will, um, uh, vaping they are and how much work that they have been doing on harm reduction. So is that just the line um, is the truth somewhere in between, or, or how does that work? Uh, sure, it's uh, it's actually wonderfully complicated. Uh, uh, th this is technology that came out of the blue and, and whacked them, um, but they had seen it coming uh, because they recognized that they had an incredibly hazardous product and it was unnecessarily hazardous. And they know, and in fact, they sell some products like smokeless tobacco that they know to be phenomenally less hazardous and it's possible for people to move to this and they're very used to being sued and uh, so looking at what can they do to prevent these things from happening. Before we even had these products in the market, they talked about not wanting to do a Kodak. They recognized disruptive technology could, could hit them and hit them really hard. Uh, they have the problem that with things like the vaping products now sold in vape shops, the the pack equivalent price is less than just the profit margin on a pack of cigarettes. So that's a, a big threat to them, and I, I think similar to what we'd see with established taxi companies looking at how on earth do we compete with this. But they recognize you can't stop it. Um, so it is the Kodak thing. If somebody's going to eat your lunch, better might as well be you. Better to, to have some part of the market than none of the market. But if you could consolidate this, come up with better products that are good enough for smokers, standardize them, mass manufacture them, you could possibly replace much of your market now with something that is more sustainable, less likely to cause lawsuits. Uh, and for some of the people inside the companies where they said, we had real trouble recruiting people. How do you get somebody who's a high flyer to come work for a cigarette company? Uh, you know, it does terrible things at a cocktail party. Uh, but. So like other big companies saying, we want to get involved in innovative stuff because that's where we bring in the new people, the new leaders. You have scientists within the companies who really see an advantage in this. They're no longer involved in trying to defend the undefensible or indefensible. They're, 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 they're coming out with, with new innovative products that are really exciting. Uh, so there's so many different dynamics at work. And I think in, in many ways it's similar to what we had with the transition from snake oil to science-based pharmaceuticals. There are some people within the companies that are doomed. You know, if your job is choosing what color of blue to use on a new pack of cigarettes and what sort of marketing schemes you can use or new jingle you can come up with, there, there's really no future for you. If you're involved in, in developing the, the science, the technology behind innovative stuff, you're golden. Uh, so there, there's these battles between the companies, there's battles within the companies, but it's exactly what you'd expect with disruptive technology. Uh, and the recognition that they really don't know where it's going to go. Wall Street's not sure where it's going to go. I think a lot of people simply don't understand the market when, when they talk about where they think you know, this could end up. And if you look at the history of innovative technology, it's really rare in, when, when I look at it to find a market dominating company uh, or industry that does well in the face of innovative technology. They're usually blown away for, for all sorts of cultural reasons. So the, the challenge to this industry and just the cigarette companies on the FT500 have a collective uh, market value now of about 550 billion US dollars. So you're dealing with a really significant player, through tons of money they're making, fundamental challenge, what are they gonna do about it? So some of them are, are grasping the opportunity, others are, are very scared of it. Uh, and the best protection they're getting, ironically, is from anti-smoking activists who are protecting the cigarette business. So I'm a big Uber user. I've used Uber in six or seven cities, and I have actually noticed, like, when I go to London, that the prices of the black cabs have actually gone down since, since I've been going over the last 20 years. And the other thing I find with Uber is I stop losing things, because when I get my wallet out to pay 
for things. I'm forever, le- I've left an iPhone, I've left five cameras over the years. <laughs> so, I mean, it's saving me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is, is about uh, vaping. Um, so, the, you know, I'm a doctor, but the, uh, my other colleagues hate this stuff. Right. And I don't know how, when I, when I tell them that, you know, there's less harm from the burning part, uh, they know this, but they say in some way it's going to keep people smoking. And I don't know how, how we convince, because if you can convince doctors that this is a, a safe alternative, you, you would, and I, I think it would help people stop smoking, which is ultimately what our, our goal is. How, how do we do that? Uh, in, in some ways, you've got Galileo's telescope again, right? I mean, you can say, look through this, uh, tell me what you see, and of course they don't see anything because their ideology prevents them uh, from seeing it. Many doctors, I mean, if they look at things like the reports from the Royal College of Physicians in the UK, uh, that's very, per- yeah, ver- no, uh, very persuasive. Uh, Public Health England, very persuasive. The Brits are in, 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 uh, far more pragmatic on these things, always have been. Uh, But there is the ideology that gets in the way, and as I said, you you have people who will make an argument, like it's only a hypothesis, no evidence to back it up, but take it as fact. And this idea that if you have a far less hazardous, far cheaper product that people would prefer to have, that will actually cause them to instead use the more expensive, more hazardous thing that they don't like. So it is like saying that, you know, if if you allow iPhones onto the market, People are, are going to go look for those old Motorola flip phones, or you know, if, if you allow them to get a, a new laptop, the next thing you know, they're going to want an Underwood typewriter. Uh, you know, we've never seen that happen. And, and when you ask, give me an example of where new, newer, safer, less expensive, more consumer acceptable technology has actually led people to use the, the previous technology or go back to the previous technology? Can you think of a single example? And, and they can't. But, but, they're, but they're, they still come up with this hypothesis, and I think it's based on this ideology. Nicotine's bad. We've got to oppose anything with nicotine. If there's any association with tobacco, even if it's not really a tobacco company, but we think it sort of looks like a tobacco company, we'll, we'll attack it. But I, I find with, with anybody with science training, if they're at all open-minded, they get it very, very quickly. And the general public gets it very quickly. So, you know, my test is boring the people I'm sitting beside on airplanes by asking them a couple of questions and find it... In, in very rare that they don't catch the idea very, very fast. If I'm speaking at a conference of anti-smoking uh, uh, colleagues, they are not going to get the concept. And, and again, it's Thomas Kuhn. Mm-hmm. Their, their whole <coughs> belief system, their, their, their lives are tied around believing something else. And if the granting agencies, particularly in the United States, have a goal of being tobacco-free and nicotine is included as being tobacco, then good luck if you're trying to publish something that says this is way less hazardous. Uh, it goes against the vested interests of the people trying to do it. But, you know, and again, the nice thing about disruptive technology is that changes. You start getting some people who speak out, who are blogging, who are active on social media, uh, and people pick up on it fairly, uh, fairly quickly. On, on, on your Uber points, I guarantee you if you leave something in Uber, you're more likely to get it back than if you leave it in a taxi. Yeah. You've got the guy's name, you've got the guy's photo, you've got his license plate. Um, it's, it's not that all taxi drivers are bad and all Uber drivers are good. It's just on average because of the accountability mechanism. I've had friends where the Uber driver shows up at their door and says, oh, you left something in in my car before they even realize that they left the thing behind in the first place. Um, And on the price, I actually, I didn't include this bit just because of the time constraints, but you know, we talk about the lobbying of taxi industries and cartels of city councils to implement minimum pricing and increase prices. I wrote an op-ed in Calgary recently where year over year over year, the prices of taxis just keep going up because the taxi companies lobby the council to keep increasing the prices. But now with the economic downturn we've had in Calgary, the taxi companies had to go hat in hand to the council to beg them for a price decrease Mm -hmm. because they were losing so much market share because people didn't want to pay the exorbitant prices. So I was saying to these guys, look, you know, instead of begging the council to increase prices and beg the council to decrease the prices, why don't you beg the council to let you set your prices? This is not complicated. (laughs) When the government uh, is saying we're going to treat vaping the same as we treat cigarette smoking and therefore we are going to ban it in public areas, you have to go out to the smoking area in order to vape, we actually have very good research saying what makes for unsuccessful smoking cessation uh, attempts. And if you're forced to be around people who are smoking, if you're forced to be in the proximity of cigarettes, you're far, far less likely to be able to quit. 
We also know the vaping technology that exists now is, is not quite as good as cigarettes in terms of getting a quick nicotine hit for most vapors, so they need to vape more often. Uh, but if you're limited to having to go out to, uh, to a smoking area, uh, it's going to be that much harder to, uh, to get what you need without reverting to cigarettes. So, so in effect, what we're doing is it's like the government saying, in order to protect you, we are going to allow uh, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. It's just they have to be held in a bar during happy hour. Um, and you have the same sort of effect. Uh, and it's just they've, you know, they, they've not been challenged sufficiently on this to think of, you know, if, what's our goal and is this a way to achieve it? You know, how would you feel about trying to get off booze by having to go to your meeting in a bar during happy hour? That's how a smoker feels if you're forced to go out to the smoking area in order to try to, uh, to get your nicotine. Thank you. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear you're addicted to analogies, but I understand it's a 12-step program for that. <laughs> my, my question was actually for Derek. Uh, Derek, uh, you mentioned uh, everybody's got a story like yours about your last taxi ride and what a disaster it was compared to your, your, uh, your Uber sort of uh, St. Paul on the way to uh, Damascus experience. <laughs> uh, so, but you left the story unfinished. I just want to find out, were you charged for that taxi ride? Um, the ta oh yeah, taxi ride, yeah we were. Now mind you, Adam always pays the bills because I'm lazy, I never take any effort to get a ride. So Adam paid for that, so I believe we were charged full price and they didn't give me any sort of fee for, for you know, stepping in being a witness unwillingly. Or <laughs> no offer was made. So yeah, yeah, charged, yeah. I, I had a taxi ride where the, the taxi blew a tire. And so I had to wait for another taxi to come on the side of the highway and got on the other taxi. And of course, as soon as I got on the other taxi, the meter went on with the minimum price. So I paid the minimum price and the base fare twice because the taxi <laughs> drew a blood tire. I was like, come on. I just have to say, this actually is the problem with any discussion about Uber and taxis is everybody wants to bring out their horror stories. Right. And it becomes sort, <laughs> of a, it becomes sort of a competition. Yeah. If you have a worse story, come up and ask a question yeah. next, yeah. <laughs> I took a taxi uh, <laughs> <laughs> this morning from the Chelsea Hotel to Hart House. The driver had never heard of Hart House. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to guide him here. So somebody from out of town was guiding a local taxi driver to get to Hart House. <laughs> but uh, my question for Peter, uh, do you have an opinion on the compensation issue for uh, I mean, it, this, these systems were set up using the uh, coercive power of the government to drive a taxi. You had to be in the system. And, uh, you know, many of these uh, people have had to buy these medallions at sometimes very, very high prices. Uh, would you favor uh, some degree of compensation to, to liquidate these schemes or not? There was an interesting debate in the National Post on this recently. And I'm just curious whether you have a view on it. Yeah. So. It's very, very complicated. Uh, I lean towards no. Um, the simpler answer is because you were doing a deal with the devil in the government, and so part of the deal with dealing with the devil is that the government can change the law whenever they want, and, and so there's no guarantee. Um, but the more um, pragmatic answer, if you like, is if you look into the details of who is paying those exorbitant prices, it's very uh, f small fraction of taxi drivers. So if you got, if you're a taxi driver and you got one of the new licenses issued by a council, you probably paid a two hundred dollar fee, and then overnight it became worth two, three, four hundred thousand dollars because you were lucky enough to win the lottery to be one of the people who got awarded one of those licenses. So if you're in that situation, you did very well out of that the second that you got your license. If you got a new license more recently, what most councils have done is said. There are now different classes of licenses, and the new licenses that you buy from the council for a couple of hundred dollars, if you wish to, st A, you must be the operator. So it can't be like a franchise model where an investment person buys them and then hires drivers. Um, but also, B, if you wish to stop driving, you must return the license to the council. So I think the only circumstances where there may be a case for some sort of compensation is when someone has purchased a license on the private market from another driver for a couple of hundred thousand dollars. But even then, if you've had that license for, long, for a long enough period of time, you've made a lot of profits based on that monopoly probably. And if you bought it recently, you probably really should have seen Uber coming. Um, I mean, if, if we compensate, at that point, 
I think if you bought a taxi license for a million dollars in New York two years ago, that was just a bad investment decision. Because it's not like no one knew about Uber or knew that Uber was coming. In fact, Uber was already operating in New York at that point. Um, and the prices of the licenses were already dropping. And if you start talking about compensating people for bad investments, well, you know, do we do that for the stock market? Do we do it for whatever? You know, at what point does it become difficult? So, yeah, I mean, you, you, it's, it's really tough for those people who just bought a license right before they started declining in value. But that happens in the housing market. That happens in all sorts of other markets as well. And I don't think we can say um, that in this one case there should be some kind of compensation. A couple of cities have looked at ways of doing this. Um, I think New South Wales and Australia is going to tack on a dollar fee for each Uber ride for the next five years. And that money is going to go into a pot. Um, but this, again, this is where the libertarian me comes out. How do you actually implement that policy of compensation? Um, because what the New South Wales government decided to do was to give the money to the, the union <laughs> of the taxi drivers to disperse as they see fit to compensate the drivers. So as soon as you start talking compensation, not only do you have to talk about is it justified, is it worth it, is it the best method, but also will it be implemented in a sensible way? And I'm, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case either. If you could present a, a really good compensation plan that excluded all the people who should have known better and that and didn't that you know that that made a huge monopoly profit off it at the point of purchase and was very narrow and limited to those few people who were just kind of unlucky in the timing maybe we could consider that but you know if you have a unicorn I'd like to see that too <laughs> uh, gentlemen thank you very much for your presentation I was greatly lo looking forward to this we've already discussed these issues beforehand um, I just wanted to point this out to people this <laughs> is an e-cigarette. <laughs> I've been vaping since 2011. These things have come light years since then, and especially since 2005 when I first found out about them. Not at all a regular smoker. I used as much as someone might use a coffee to pep themselves up in the morning. It's a modulator, so you know when you're when you need to be up, you can get up. When you need to go to bed, you can go to bed. That's that's one of the uh, qualities of nicotine. Um, I wanted to point out that this is, other than language and the internet, one of the most free market devices ever invented, without government intervention at all. A few years ago, in the past, I'd say three years, there was a VHS beta type battle for interfaces for e-cigarettes. One was from a company called Joytech in China, which developed something called a 510. And another one was from another company called Ego. And Joytech won over. You can still buy Ego, it's still very popular. There's a $5 adapter you, know, you can use for the screw adapter. But essentially, this tip will interface with any tank, and the tank will interface with any battery. So they, the, the market decided upon these mechanisms and everything has been incredible, the growth has been exponential, and this is nothing compared to what's out there. There's something called sub-ohm devices, which allow for far more heat to be generated to the point that you can, if you are irresponsible, you can burn your lips off. So, uh, but those are very powerful devices and they can deliver a tremendous amount of nicotine to the heaviest of Sounds smokers. very dangerous, it might be regulated. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, 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 has, that, that has not been brought up by any regulators thus far, but you can count on it being brought up. Um, in terms of nicotine, uh, the only, in looking at meta-analysis, the only, um, there, I mean, there, there's a net positive in terms of um, the consumption of nicotine for neuroprotection rather than anything to the opposite. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. And in terms of the big thing today, what's being used by regulators to justify intervention in the e-cigarette market is one chemical, an additive called diacetyl, which is used as, it's a buttery flavor. It's obviously, it's a chemical. And it dem demonstrably causes a condition 
in popcorn factories when making the buttery flavor, something called um, popcorn lung, or it's called bronchiolitis obliterans, so it, it basically obliterates the bronchioles and causes uh, a, a, a devastating, permanent, irreversible condition. The two people in the study that was referenced recently that has been bandied about in the press, two people out of millions and millions of long-term e-cigarette smokers developed what they claim was popcorn lung, which of course reversed itself in a few months. Recall, it's devastating, permanent, and irreversible. So it's not popcorn lung, but that is being used as the big thing these days in an attempt to regulate e-cigarettes. And any studies done in the past referenced previous generations of e-cigarettes that people don't even use anymore, and they said they're somehow dangerous, even though the average cigarette contains roughly 4,000 chemicals, and when burned, creates even more uh, chemicals, especially carbon monoxide, because that's what happens when you burn things as opposed to vape things. So I wanted to mention that, and then with respect to Uber, do you have a bad taxi experience to share as well? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think everyone it's is hearing of grievances. The, I think. the last <laughs> bad taxi experience I had was simply was, was simply trying to get a, a cab um, Saturday night. Not a particularly interesting night. Not a not some sort of a long weekend. Two a.m. last call, and I called the cab company just as you said. Busy, busy, busy. Then half an hour. Then you can't get anything oh, it's coming, it's coming, and then you finally flag down a cab, and you can't even fit everyone in the cab, and then it's just a total nightmare. But I wanted, what I wanted to mention, <laughs> what I wanted, I wanted to mention one more thing regarding what you, 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 it's sort of like an elephant in the room in terms of ratings and reviews, is the dark net markets with respect to illegal drug trade. That is something where with my research that I've done in terms of people who are really trying to slag the drug market, saying they're extremely dangerous, looking at the supply side, there were no bodies that ever resulted from the trade of drugs. Looking at the demand side, out of millions of transactions, there were literally a report of something like five deaths because someone did something um, in terms of supplying an, uh, an, an adulterated drug. So it was the most, it was the safest distribution of drugs in a, in a prohibition mechanism that has ever existed in, in human history. That's all I wanted to mention. Thank you very much. The, the, the related aspect to that is uh, kind of a decentralized network, which I didn't get to either. Um, but I, I've made the point to several councils when I've submitted to them you can do whatever you want for regulations for Uber, but there is literally nothing stopping a kid in a basement somewhere creating the same app. Yeah. And as long as the kid doesn't care about making a profit as a centralized company, he just sets the app up such that 100% of the cost of the fare goes from the rider to the driver. There's no central organization collecting the money. There's no central organization to be taxed, to be regulated. It's just individual drivers. And at that point, how do you regulate that? Do you start having the police knock on the door of every car and say, is this person in the back of your car an Uber rider? Are, are, are they paying you or are they not? Like, it's completely unenforceable at that point. Mm -hmm. So I, I've been encouraging them, look, you've got to get the safety stuff right. You've got to have the regulation be as minimal as possible. And in some ways, that may disincentivize someone from needing to set up a decentralized model. I suspect it's coming anyway, the way that technology is going. But I did mention briefly, I think we're heading to the point where governments can't enforce these sorts of things anyway. And so we're going to rely more and more on the technology and the platforms and the rating systems to enforce the safety and the reputations and things like that. And, and maybe that's a good thing. We can debate that another time, but yeah, thank well, you. I just say always ask if someone wants to regulate something because of harm, where are the bodies? Always <laughs> ask that question because there rarely are any. Thank you. So we've had an airing of grievances now, yes. so we expect and Andy to do a feat of strength. Uh, well, we have the fist of us poll as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. so. <laughs> uh, just for, I, I may be the only one in the room who does not know how these things work. I've seen people use them. Could you explain briefly how vaping cigarettes or these vapor things work? Chris can tell you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, 
my understanding of technology was shown with my expertise on PowerPoint. Um, I, uh, I didn't uh, see any problems with your PowerPoint. That's right, exactly. <laughs> uh, it changes so rapidly. I would do the same thing that if you asked me about uh, the latest incarnation of, of some uh, other form of software, I'd say, just a second, I'm going to call an 18-year-old. Okay. Uh, I find the, the people who are actually using the product really know it. And any time that I think I'm an expert and I'm approached as an expert, all I need to do if I ever fall into that trap is walk into a cafe, talk to somebody who's actually using the product and ask them. So and we'll yeah, I'm reminded of, uh, it was a Noam Chomsky uh, line of saying, anybody who thinks that the average person isn't capable of engaging in, in you know, detailed discourse on, on politics as opposed to having been disengaged, need only listen to sports radio and the phone-in shows <laughs> and what people know. So, you know, the, the local apprentice uh, plumber uh, who is going to know the, the batting average of everybody on the Blue Jays sort of thing. Uh, so I've read about them. Um, I understand some of the technology, sure. but it's essentially just the, the concept's really simple. And I think we, we need to avoid getting caught up with any particular product. The idea that you deliver nicotine without the smoke, you solve the problem. This is one way that's doing it. There's other people have other ideas out there. And some of them, I think, are phenomenal if you just open the market. Uh, so that we have entrepreneurs, I talk to venture capitalists who see huge potential in product innovation. They think they, they can outdo the sorts of things that exist now. There's others who say, no, the big advantage is going to be on consolidating the vape shop business, to come up with something that's closer to a Starbucks model. You'll get consistent, high quality product, you know, if you go to one of their shops and they, they will go national with these. Once they feel that they can do it, that, that they're not going to spend a billion dollars rolling something out to become a new Starbucks and then have somebody shut them down. Perhaps an app that delivers it to you. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's right. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's moving uh, very rapidly. And I, usually when I come to give talks like this, I bring devices to show people. Uh, inevitably, before I get to the talks, I meet people who are smokers and we end up talking about these and then I give the devices away. So then I show up and I don't have anything to show, but there's invariably somebody in the audience who, uh, who has the products. Thanks.